Welcome to our lunchtime coffee webinar. Today we're going to look at sort of the darker underside of Google. So we're going to have some fun, but we're also going to look at, you know, how Google sort of manipulates the world around it and tries to make us all advertise and convince us that they're not evil and all those wonderful things that all sorts of large corporations do uh, about their brand image. So we're going to look at that and we're going to have a little humor and also a little seriousness as we approach uh, the ecosystem around Google as a search engine. Uh, so a little bit about what we're doing at the JM Internet Group. For those that don't know, we teach SEO, which is search engine optimization. We teach social media marketing, and we also teach the Google AdWords product, uh, pay-per-click advertising. My uh, PowerPoint needs to cooperate here. We're going to give hands-on step-by-step instructions. We always do that on our webinars. We try to make them interactive and fun. And today we're going to look at sort of the darker side of Google and look at it sort of from a perspective uh, of a little bit of a cynical business person. What do they do? Uh, so for those who don't know about us, we teach classes. Here's our shameless plug uh, for our classes. We're going to have our next live series up in April. So if you have time and a little tiny budget, it's a good opportunity uh, to get uh, educated about how to play these games and win. Uh, my name is Jason McDonald. I love teaching these classes. I do corporate training. I do all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, I'm crazy enough to do this. I encourage questions from all of my students. I really, really enjoy questions, so don't hesitate. If you're watching this uh, in the archive video format, reach out to me with questions. I'm happy to entertain questions. Oh, my PowerPoint's just, it's ready for Friday to go home. Copyright and obligatory legal stuff, and then we'll get started. We're going to make commentary on website design and structure. No way are we being negative about any company or products, including Google. They're all corporations. They're all trying to make money. We're all adults. We all understand that. Secondly, the webinar is a private communication between the JM Internet Group and attendees, so it's copyrighted. And third, SEO is an art and not a science, so make changes to your websites at your own Risk. Let's just talk a little bit about secrets and lies as we get started in our agenda. So all companies have secrets. All companies have uh, <clears throat> trade secrets, things that they don't necessarily want people to know, things that they sort of hide a little bit from the outside world. And some corporations have lies in sort of a marketing sense, things that they do that you kind of look at them and think, you know, that's not exactly being honest. And that's kind of where we're going with today's webinar. We're looking at some of the secrets and some of the areas where you really have to look at what Google does and say, you know, that's kind of at the edge there, Google, uh, of what's being, um, shall we say, uh, putting your best foot forward as an honest corporate citizen. We're going to go through our 10 secrets and lies, and then we're going to have time for some questions and answers. All right, so Google's motto, of course, don't be evil. I mean, anytime you have a motto like that, you set yourself up to a very high standard. And I don't think Google is more evil than your average corporation, but I'm not sure that's a really high threshold. Uh, certainly, Google has secrets or even some things where I think they really bend the truth, especially things that they don't exactly want small business to focus on. And I want to go through some of the things I see in the Googleplex uh, that are puzzling and actually provide some opportunities uh, for people who understand them uh, to leverage them. So let's start with some fun. Let's start with Easter eggs. So for those who don't know what an Easter egg is, an Easter egg is... Um, an item, a type of code that's hidden in software by developers. And Google has some Easter eggs as well as some tricks in the way that you can approach Google that can be funny and also some that can help you. So this is my first sort of secret to share with you the concept of Easter eggs. You may not have heard of them uh, and, and make you realize that there are Easter eggs on the Google search engine. So let's go over and look at our instructor links. And of course, you're all going to get an email Tomorrow, a.k.a. Saturday or over the weekend, you'll get an email with all of these links, so don't worry about it. So let's look at our first Easter eggs. Talk about what these mean and what they tell us about Google. So let's go to the Google search engine, and let's type in the word tilt, T-I-L-T. And you'll notice, you can see your screen there, it actually tilts the results in the Google search. So that's pretty neat to do that one. Let's go back, and you can do this with this queue. Same thing, it'll tilt the Google search engine. So that's kind of fun. 
And then watch this one. Let's hope we can get this one to go. You have to have Flash installed to make this work. And I'm going to go do a barrel roll, and you'll watch it. It'll spin the Google search result as you get started. So Google has certain elements in the Google code which are hidden. Those are called Easter eggs, and they're a lot of fun. Let me show you another one. Type in the loneliest number and hit enter and it shows you that Google is sort of a fan of three dog night and the loneliest number is one. So those are called Easter eggs and they're hidden in the Google code. Now there are other codes that are pretty interesting uh, that you can work on Google as well that help you as a small business person understand uh, how to sort of look for keywords, look for opportunities. I'm going to share just a couple of those. And the purpose of today's session is to get you to think there's some secrets out here that I maybe don't know about on Google. So let's talk about some of these secrets. So one of them is the tilde command. You can put the tilde in and you can put anything you're interested in. You can put in tilde, let's put in tilde coupon and hit enter. And you'll see that everything that's bolded, coupon, discount, voucher, this is a way of asking Google what are closely related words to that word coupon. So tilde is a very interesting, fun little code that you can put into Google and learn. So that's one that's interesting. A couple other ones that are fun. Say you have a website that you're interested in, like we can just take discount tire. You can type in related colon and then discounttire.com and Google's going to show you similar websites, closely linked websites. This is a great discovery trick to know about Google and they don't exactly advertise uh, where these are. You have to sort of know to look for them. That's another one that I wanted to share with you. Let me share with you another one that's pretty cool. Type in site colon and we can take tirerack.com right there. This is a way to see how many results are in the Google search engine. You can also go over here and see how many are in the past month. This gives you a sense of your indexing pattern and your relationships. So site colon and a web address, a domain, is a very helpful way. Now, watch your uh, what's called your Google preview. Over here on the right, you can click on the cached link, and you can see how recently Google indexed your content. So there's a bunch of sort of secret codes in there that you can learn, and I'm going to have links in there for you about more little secret codes out there. I actually have another one that's kind of interesting. Once you know how to do a good search, you can do site colon google.com slash ads, and you can find all of their special offers running uh, for free discounts on AdWords. So once you know how to manipulate uh, the Google Easter eggs and codes, you can actually have some fun and you can actually leverage that uh, to save yourself some money, to be a better searcher, to be a better uh, SEO person. Now, the point of the webinars that we do sort of lunch coffee, lunch out here on the East Coast, coffee back there for those on the, or, I'm sorry, lunch on the West Coast, coffee for those who it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, East Coast people, is to think about what does this mean. So let's think about what do Easter eggs tell us about Google. One of the things that's so important that Easter eggs tell us is that humans program Google. Google's approach to the media, Google's approach to the FTC is to act like this code sort of came down from heaven like Moses and the tablets and there were no people involved. It's just totally, absolutely, 100% impartial. What Easter eggs tell us about Google is that humans are making judgments about what they want to show and what not to show. Some of these are algorithmic, they're built into the software, and what Easter eggs show is they're actually manual kludges in the code, and that's really important. It tells us we have to pay attention to the philosophy of Google as an organization, that they are creating code in a certain way and it is, shocker, beneficial to Google. So we want to think about Easter eggs as an example of some probably more important things going on behind the scenes over there at Google. <clears throat> so let's talk about our second 
Easter egg, our second secret, our second. So the, the, the idea here is the organic results versus our AdWords results. And there are lots of, of signs out there, lots of leaked dark documents, lots of rumors that talk about how much the organic or free results outperform the AdWords results. And let's go and look at this and what we mean here. So let's just make sure, first of all, that we know the structure of a Google search really quickly. Let's type in motorcycle insurance quote, some sort of search. I'm going to sign out here. I always want to be signed out when I do my Google searches, so I'm hopefully seeing sort of the world as it is. And let's just make sure really quickly that everybody understands that's the search phrase. These are the ads, top left and top right. These are our natural or organic results going in order. So we have our ads versus our SEO. So the question is, what percent of clicks go to the SEO uh, part of the page, the top results here, versus the AdWords results? And we'd like to know that. That would tell us where to put our efforts. So there's a bunch of different little studies I have linked to there. There's a new study out by Slingshot SEO, which is really cool. It's more focused on the CTRs, the click-through rates for the organic listings. But what it tells you is heavily, you know, winner-take-all. The top result on an average uh, organic is 18% of the clicks on the whole page. That tells you something very important. A lot of those clicks are going to those organic results. There are other areas. There are some um, search, uh, some uh, documents, conferences, conversations that I have linked to you that talk about the relationship between the organic and the uh, AdWords clicks. Uh, one of those it talks about some people from Google at some of these conferences, and they said somewhere 65% of our clicks go to organic, 35% AdWords. Uh, some elsewhere say 14% go to the paid results, 86%. Regardless, we see again and again that the organic results are more effective and heavier than the AdWords. Now, guess what? Google heavily promotes advertising and not organic and never releases studies showing the relative click performance of the two. That tells us something very important about the relative importance and power of our SEO versus our AdWords. So what do we mean here? Let's talk about how much money Google makes from advertising. 96% of its revenue, 96% of the revenue of the corporation comes from advertising. Not surprisingly, Google promotes AdWords as the solution to all of your business marketing needs. There are ads on Google throughout the content network. There are Google engaged uh, programs to encourage people to sell you on AdWords. There are AdWords seminars and online classrooms. They're amazing promotion to get people to advertise. And I don't begrudge Google for that, but it shows you that it's promoting perhaps 20% of the performance with this heavy, heavy campaign to get you to advertise, and it's not promoting the other side uh, of the equation. I have a nice graphic here from WordStream, which you can load, which talks about how much revenue they get and where that revenue comes from. Just gives you a sense of, you know, what do they say? Follow the money. Where's the money that Google's making? And that tells us something about it as an organization. Now, within SEO, okay, there's not a lot of promotion on Google at SEO. In fact, there's sort of a little bit of a war there between Google as an organization and the SEO community. And I'm not a believer that this is a completely hostile relationship, but it is somewhat tense. So there's one little guide I want to make sure that everybody's aware of. I share it with everybody who takes my classes. So Google's got amazing uh, promotion for AdWords. There's one little search engine optimization guide that really tells you in a very serious way what you should do to promote your website on Google. So poor little SEO gets a tiny little PDF, and AdWords gets advertising, uh, promotions, road trips, webinars, all sorts of stuff. So let's talk realistically about what Google's doing. It's heavily promoting advertising and throwing a tiny bone uh, to SEO. And that's fine, but as SEO people, we want to know and look for that treasure. Let's talk about our third sort of secret about Google. So lots of people know that links matter to Google. 
that inbound links really matter. You've got to get inbound links. What's the secret here? What's the thing that I think makes Google a little uncomfortable about inbound links? What makes it uncomfortable is this fact. There are rampant paid link schemes on the Internet, and many of them are very effective. So people are buying links, people are scheming with link schemes, and to be very brutally honest, Google does not do a very good job at policing link schemes. So they're out there, and your competitors may be using them, and I think Google would, you know, it's sort of like the police force. They'd rather not admit, you know, the level of drug abuse in the country because that would show how ineffective uh, the legal system is. Same idea here. Now, what are we talking about? I have some examples here. So let's do a search for private investigator, and let's change our location to New York, New York. So let's do a search for private investigator, New York, New York. And I want to show you this company here. And I don't know this company. I'm not saying anything about their level of professionalism as a private investigator. Take a look at this company. This is a private investigator. Look at that domain, pvtis.com. I want you to do this with searches that matter to you. Now, let's take pvtis.com, and let's go over, and let's look at a Bleco search. So Bleco is a great little search engine. So this is a Bleco search for the inbound links to pvtis.com. So I'd like you to spend a little time checking this out. Go and look at some of the links that are inbound to this, and it's a little bit hard to find these on the fly, but you'll find some, let's see here, radio free, the whatever. So this is an example of a website that's linking to them. Let's see if I can find any sort of in here. They're hard to find. Or is that Saliant Group? So you kind of go in here and spend some time. And what you're going to find is they have a lot of decent links for sure, but they also have a lot of links like this guy here. So Silent Pictures is linking over to a private investigator in New York City. That private investigator firm is doing well for the searches. What does this tell us about Google and private links? It tells us that there is a lot of link manipulation. I have another one here, which is a, a Saliant, which is showing up in uh, private um, travel nursing, and a lot of really strange links coming out to this company. And I'm not beating on these two companies in particular. What's going on is a lot of link schemes are out there. You as a business may be competing against these. Google is not really telling us how manipulative link schemes can be and how effective they can be. We as business people have to compete against this. I want to compete at least sort of with the high road. When I teach my classes, this is one of the reasons I'm a huge advocate of generating news releases on a very regular basis. It's sort of your best white hat strategy uh, to work against uh, inbound link buying. Okay, secret number four, sort of related. So first thing we have to understand is Google, like Microsoft before it, Google heavily favors its own properties. And you see this very dramatically with respect to Google Places. It favors Google Places over Yelp or City Search in terms of the search positions. And it's clearly beginning to favor Google Plus over competitors like, say, Facebook or Twitter. Within this aspect, reviews are very, very important. And guess what? Paid review schemes are also rampant on the Internet. So what are we talking about here? <clears throat> so let's look at reviews, and let's look at some examples. Again, we can use some of these companies we just looked at. When you do a search for, let's go over here to our search. Let's do that search for private investigator. You'll see that a lot of these guys have reviews. Six reviews, seven reviews, 14 reviews. One of the things that's going on is, so let's check this one out, is there is a fair number of, shall we say, possibly paid reviews, possibly 
best friend reviews. There's not a very good part on the Google algorithm of screening out reviews. So there's a whole war going out there that you as a small business have to pay attention to where reviews are a little skeptical. So let's take some reviews here. Let's click on the third bridge. And let's see, he has only one review, and his only review that he's written is about a private investigator. These guys are the best at what they do. It could be a real review. It might not be a real review. I have some other examples out there. Here's one for Fred Smith Plumbing. Totally different company. Shows up well on Google searches. He's got how many reviews? 55 reviews for his plumbing company. Now check some of his reviews out. Let's check out Emily. Go look at Emily. Emily has only written one review, and she absolutely loved this plumbing company. So you want to start to look at Google. Realize that when you go and do a Google search like plumber, first of all, it's favoring companies that are participating in Google Places. Companies do this all the time. They favor their own related products rather than competitor products. Is it illegal? I'm not a lawyer, but Microsoft certainly got into trouble with this. It definitely gets into that area of maybe this is sort of a secret to Google about how much they're favoring places. And then within the review system, there are a lot of fake reviews, a lot of ridiculous reviews. How do you combat that? Obviously, you've got to use Google Places if you want to show up on Google, and you've got to solicit reviews in an honest fashion. You've got to try to get honest customers to review you to compensate against your competitors that may be manipulating reviews. It's a much uh, more competitive, a much dirtier race than this sort of don't be evil, happy people at Google would have us believe. It's a little bit of a compact uh, contact sport there. Number five, let's talk about AdWords. So AdWords, I am an advocate of AdWords. I think it's a very good product. I think there's a lot of fantastic things you can do with AdWords. However, there are certain horrible gotchas in AdWords. One of the big ones is what's called the broad match. Most advertisers do not understand what broad match means, and they're wasting a ton of money on the back end by bad match types. The secret, the tip, the thing that Google is kind of doing that you really think, gosh, we're getting on the edge here of a, a perhaps we're not evil, but we're not being good, is the default setting in AdWords is to turn on broad match. What do we mean by broad match? So I have sort of some examples here just to sort of get you a sense of it. I have a link to the explanation. If you dig deep into Google, you can find the explanation and understand it. So it's not a total secret. It's a, a little bit hidden. You have to know what it is. You have to go look for it. You have to understand it to be a better advertiser. What are we talking about? Let me show you on some searches. If you do a Google search, and you use the tilde command, you can get a sense of how this works. So let's take a tilde command animal. This is almost a way of saying, where would Google match your ad? So if you put an ad in the system that perhaps said animal boarding, and maybe you only did dog boarding, okay? Or you put in dog, and you only do dogs, and you don't do cats. The problem in broad match is that Google is matching that search animal for dog, that search for cat. If you're doing dog, you might be showing your ad for cats. You might be getting unnecessary bad clicks uh, versus that match type. You have to kind of see this in action. You have to know what it is. The tilde command is the best non-participatory way to see whether these matches are good or not. And you can see it thinks that dog, cat, and animal are closely related, which they are. But if I only board cats, I don't want dog people clicking through on my ad, and, and there's an issue there. Now, what are we talking about in terms of AdWords? So let's go into AdWords. So I'm going to sign in real quick and show you. And many people, I, I can't tell you how many people I've taught AdWords have never seen this, don't understand it. So let me show you over here. I'm going to open up a campaign real quick on broad match. So let me open this up to all time. 
So if you're running on broad match, and I think there are reasons why you would want to do it, you want to make sure that you understand no quotes, no brackets, etc. Go see search terms on your keywords tab all, and then voila, you suddenly start to see, and sometimes you'll find this kind of thing. You can see that this campaign for SEO training somehow got 11 clicks for people searching for Google Ads G double click. So you want to look at those matches and look for bad match types. The default setting, the way that they set up AdWords, leads you down the primrose path of using broad match. Not the most advised thing to do. So I call that a Google secret, is to understand match. Secret number six while we're looking at AdWords is the display network. The display network is also very broad. The default setting is on. Most people do not understand the display network. When you set up a campaign on AdWords, new campaign, this guy right here, all available sites recommended, click let me choose, most people do not understand what these differences are, and Google leads you right down the primrose path of turning all of that on at the same time. Now, there are some bad things in the display network. There are some good things. There are some wonderful things. But there are some areas where, you know, Google, we could have done a better job for your average novice advertiser. Now, let's talk about some things here which get a little shall we say, on the darker side. So within AdWords, there's what's called parked domains. Parked domains are these weird little web websites that just have ads upon ads upon ads upon ads upon ads. Here's the official Google policy. Parked domains are prohibited where the domain name resolves to a website that just displays advertising lists and links, right? So they're officially telling us that if you run a parked domain in their program that just is pure ads, we will kick you out. Now, they have an affiliated program called AdSense for Domains. This is what they're telling the publishers. And they're doing some changes here. They're under some litigation over this problem in their system. And they're basically talking about how you connect to Google and send it keyword hints for your domains. Now, what do we see in the real world? I have some examples of parked domains that are in the Google system. So this is a parked domain, familyguyfilms.com. This is ads upon ads upon ads upon ads. If you hold your cursor here at the very bottom, watch down here at the very bottom of my screen, bottom left, you'll see that it's going through to over here on the right, it moved to the right for me. It's moving to the left and the right. You'll see it says GoogleAdServices.com. These are running through the Google network. So this is pretty much in direct violation of what they just said their official policy was. Now, they might claim, oh, we don't really know what's going on on this website. But, I mean, come on. The whole website is solid ads. They're Google. They should be able to realize that this, ad, this whole website is in violation of their program. There are lots of parked domains out there. Here's another example. This is a lingerie website. It's just searches upon searches upon searches. So the parked domains problem exists inside AdWords. Google kind of leads us down the primrose path when we set up an account of putting us on domains. Most people do not know where do you go to turn these guys off. Let me show you. You go into your campaign that's running on Display Network. You go into Networks. You go way down to the bottom. Exclusions. Add Exclusions. Exclude Category. You can see how easy it is. And here's where you exclude this. So they've buried the ability to quote unquote opt out of the parked domains and all sorts of other little nefarious tricks out there. Other interesting issue here, I have a nice link for you. There's a whole bunch of litigation going on over AdWords, park domains, match types. Google just won part of the case apparently and throwing it out as a class action lawsuit. 
but there are many advertisers that are not happy with how this has all been set up. So that's unfortunately part of our <clears throat> Google secrets out there that we want to be aware of. Now, as advertisers, I think AdWords is very valuable. You have to know what you're doing and not do it in a manipulative, bad way. You've got to understand it. So that's our number six secret. Let's talk a little bit about number seven, which is privacy. And I'm sure you've probably heard Google is in a lot of trouble over rigging the Safari browser to show ads. It's actually in trouble with the FTC. It's probably going to pay some hefty fines over how it manipulated the privacy issue. So privacy is a big issue with Google, and there are some problems in privacy. Now, there are some other interesting aspects that are kind of, in a twisted way, somewhat positive as an advertiser. I have a nice link for you about what's called remarketing. Here's where you can use the way that Google is, um, shall we say, being very lenient with privacy, and it's allowing you to sort of track people who hit your website you can track them as they, not really track them, but you can serve ads to them, to be more judicious with my words. You can, tr you can show ads to them as they browse the web based on a one touch that they took on your website. So this is where Google's privacy is somewhat in tension with its, a, its, a, its interest in serving ads. The magic thing to understand is what's called remarketing. You can leverage this for your advertising, and it's pretty effective. We're actually using it for our ads, so it's pretty cool. There's a lot of heat out there about what this all means. So Google privacy is an area where I would just put sort of a question mark about how this sorts out for small business. Is it good? Is it bad? Let's talk a little bit about Google+. Plus. People who have taken my classes recently uh, know that I am a huge advocate of participating in Google Plus in a very self-interested way. Google is leveraging its domination of search to catalyze the growth of Google Plus. And if you're interested in showing up for searches, you want to participate in Google Plus. And let me show you some examples here. So let's do a search. Let me sign out here because I always want to sign out when I'm just trying to look at the world. So here's a search for SEO. And I want to just draw your attention to this stuff over here. So Google is starting to reward, oh that's interesting, Google employee. So Google is starting to reward people who are participating in Google Plus by showing them as gurus in that industry. And that's not really uh, unethical, it's just an example of Google leveraging search to give us all a big reason for why we should be part of Google Plus. Other examples are when you do searches, you can do a search for social media classes, and you'll often see my picture show up here. That's also because of Google Plus and what's called authorship and enabling authorship correctly. So they're just like they do with Google Places, they're leveraging their dominance in search to give birth to catalyze the growth of Google Plus. As a small business, as a marketer, this represents an opportunity for us to work with Google, so to speak, to get our own uh, information out there. I have the link over to you on Google Plus to some uh, posts. I have a nice uh, YouTube post and um, I have a nice uh, tutorial about how to get your authorship showing up and this kind of thing. Uh, out there. So you want to make sure. Also, when you do a search where you start to see those pictures, you'll see this link over here. You can click there and they talk about related people and pages and how you show up. So it's an example of Google using its search engine to push uh, people into Google+. Corporate America leveraging all that fun stuff that all the other corporations are doing, Google does it too. Let's talk a little bit about geotargeting. This is sort of a nuance, but I've actually had people either take the classes, send me emails where they've said, you know, it's really weird. I set my geotargeting. I just want to target people in New York City. And then I look at my analytics report and I find out I'm getting people from Florida or Canada or South Africa showing up in my advertising. How can this be? 
Well, what's going on is most people understand geotargeting when you set it up inside AdWords. People think if I geotarget New York City, that that just means they're physically in New York at that particular type. Google is enhancing that, so to speak. If somebody searches like New York City roofer and they're in San Francisco, but they put in those keywords, they'll often see your ad. And that's explained in the bowels of the help files. They explain that geotargeting in the United States also includes searches that have the city name in them. So what do we mean here? Let's say that we're, let me go over into Chrome. Let's say we're, we're doing a roofing company. And let's set our location to New York City. So I do roofing company. I'm seeing ads and stuff relating to that. But if somebody is actually in, say, San Francisco, and they type in NYC Roofing Company, these ads are often geotargeted, so to speak, without the advertiser really understanding, I'm actually in San Francisco, but I'm seeing your ad that you think is geotargeted to New York City because I put the word here. That's not an area where I would be up in arms and outraged at Google, but it is different than what most people think is happening inside of AdWords. So I draw that attention. I think that's an interesting example. And remember back to the Easter eggs discussion. What does this tell us? The philosophy of Google when it comes to AdWords is broader is better. So they tend to be very broad in how they interpret where to show your ads, even if maybe that's not exactly what you wanted. So you've got to be a little cynical about how they manipulate AdWords and realize they're always going to be on the broad side of how to interpret a search, and you may not want that. So it's a, an example of the more you know, the more you can refine and be more skilled in dealing with that. Secret number 10 in my top 10 would be YouTube. Most people know, although I'm surprised when I teach classes, a lot of people do not know that Google controls YouTube. Google owns YouTube. And YouTube is the number two search engine on the Internet. It's bigger than Bing. Google favors YouTube content over other content. It's pretty clear that Google favors YouTube content. So I have some searches just to show you. You do a search how to put on eyeliner, and you'll notice, and you see other videos, but you're going to see a lot of YouTube videos for searches that are sort of how to do X, how to do Y. This creates opportunities. Putting video up on your website that's hosted on YouTube, that has keywords in the title of the video, that has keywords in the description of the video is a way to leverage Google's, shall we say, good relationship with YouTube to reach your customers. So Google's relationship with YouTube how to put on eyeliner. You see it a lot with the how-to searches. How to tie a tie. You'll see a lot of YouTube showing up here. And if you think about it, I mean, this is, you know, maybe you're a tie company. How to tie a tie. This is a very important space to occupy um, on a search. So YouTube uh, is favored by Google. Is that bad? Is it good? A lot of these secrets, lies, Easter eggs, they're not really good or bad, what I think is important is to understand them and then look at them from a marketing perspective. How can I use those? How can I understand the way Google's manipulating search to be a better Googler, a better SEOer, a better social media person, a better AdWords advertiser, and promote my company uh, by taking advantage of uh, the free and paid opportunities represented by Google. So I try to be an adult about this. I love Google. I think it's a fantastic company. I love AdWords, but I'm an adult, and I realize Google makes 96% of its kajillions of dollars off of advertising, and it tilts things just like when you type in tilt on that search, and it tilts the page over. Google tilts things to lead us in directions that may not always be beneficial uh, to us. So Google has secrets and probably some 
lies about how it operates, we want to understand those secrets and lies and learn how to live with them, manipulate them, work with them uh, to our advantage. Some of the secrets are what I call gotchas. AdWords broad match is a gotcha. You don't realize that what you're doing is you're being very broad. You're running your ad on dog boarding and Google's matching cat boarding and oops, you didn't really understand what was going on. You put on the display network, you didn't realize that you're running on park domains and it's this crazy world of mirrors where lots of clicks are generated but not a lot of, of good uh, conversions to real sales. So some of those secrets are gotcha secrets. Other secrets, how Google promotes its own products. Not surprisingly, Google favors its own products. It favors Google Places over Yelp. It favors Google Plus over Facebook, over Twitter. It favors YouTube over alternative video sites. And it cross favors those who help it with its own products. So you can see that there is some favoritism at work in the way the search engine is built. The biggest secret, I think, is that SEO can be a lot more effective than AdWords, and I think we have to realize AdWords is where Google makes its money. It's got a budget. It's got lots of people advocating it. There's no advocacy on Google in terms of free SEO. I'm going to compensate as a marketer and work harder on my SEO than on my AdWords because I know Google's not going to promote that. Uh, for me. So summing up sort of, and this is always these quick webinars, I hope to get your juices full and give you some ideas, be controversial, go and get your other workers, send me some hate mail about how crazy some of my ideas are, whatever gets you excited is what my objective is. You know, write that congressman, there are clearly some ways that Google is um, using its uh, monopoly in search. Um, I'm particularly concerned with Yelp, I love Yelp as a business, I think Yelp is in deep trouble with respect to Google+. So write that congressman, try to get a more level playing field out there, and also just day-to-day -day learn how to leverage some of Google's secrets for your own marketing goals. So we'll have time for, uh, I guess we have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. Uh, the webinar will be up uh, late today. We'll send out the email um, probably, I think it goes out automatically in 24 hours. So you'll have the email with all the logins and you can check all the links out and really have some fun and educate yourself about uh, Google secrets, lies, and Easter eggs. Okay, so here we go. I have a lot of questions, so let's just start here. Um, oh, they're scrolling here so fast. I'm having a hard time keeping up with them. Um, Okay, what about the new Google SEO rules that have been recently announced? Yeah, okay, this is really interesting. Uh, there was a big uh, scuttlebutt about, I guess it was about a week or so, where people started saying that Google is going to ding sites that don't, that have too much content or sites that are too keyword heavy and, you know, sort of part of the whole panda thing. I, I do find as a Google watcher, a lot of times they, they'll make announcements uh, that, uh, you know, such and such is going to happen and the search engine is going to dramatically change and then nothing really changes. So I'm always skeptical about that. I think there's a publicity machine over at Google that sometimes tries to scare us. It's a little bit like before uh, New Year's Eve when we have all the drunk driving checkpoints and that sort of makes the police feel that they're doing a good job and it makes the public think, oh my gosh, this is something to be scared of. Does it really change behavior? I'm not so sure. So I think I always take that with a grain of salt. The two changes, let me talk about two changes that I do see rolling out, which I think are hugely important. So the first change that Google's rolling out is when you do a search, social media classes, you start to see pictures, you start to see authorship. If you're logged in, I think I'm logged in over here, you log in. <clears throat> when you're logged in, just log in real quick and then do a Google search. Okay, so let's go to Google search. When you're logged in and you do a search for anything, Facebook timeline, whatever, you start to see this guy up here, personal results. So what's going on that's very exciting and different is personalization, you're starting to see pictures outside even if you're not signed in. So even if you're not signed in, 
you're starting to see pictures show up. So this socialization of search, search becoming social, which has to do with authorship, your relationship to your friends, that's the interconnection between Google and search. That is a big change in the last six to nine months, much bigger than sort of their saber rattling about, oh, we're going to change the way we deal with keywords. I always take that with a grain of salt because I've heard them say that 30 times, and it doesn't seem to change very much at the ground level. The other big change that's interesting, so notice how this is um, – Let's take a tra let's let me see if I can show you this. Let's do like SEO training and change the location to Dallas, Texas. And what you'll notice is you start to see different stuff. See this page right here? That's our landing page for Dallas, Texas, and it's showing on the search for just a generic SEO training, a short tail search. So you're starting to see heavy localization even of short term or short tail search words that's a big change so wrapping up this concept i think the two big changes are social search and localization and both of those are kind of going on steroids right now other recent changes i kind of roll my eye i'm out here in california land of medical marijuana you know, they say a lot of things about drug policy, and it's on the ground. It's very different than what they say politically. So I'm always going to say, let's look at this at the ground level, uh, what's really changing. Okay, how can you tell if you are in Google's bad books, so to speak? Uh, the easiest way, if you generally, you'll see this. You'll if you go to a Google search that where you if you get uh, blacklisted. You do a site colon, put your domain in, and this will be zero. So site colon, and that means you've been blacklisted when you were doing well, and then you just go to zero. That's where I really think you see uh, a very uh, example where you've really been penalized. You've really done something to tick them off, and they take you out. So site colon in your domain is a way to see bad graces. Where I think you see this whole idea about the panda thing these sorts of websites like eHow they got really slammed with what was called panda the panda update i personally didn't see this impact a lot of small businesses i think in the um searches here let me see here i have a link here on dirty little secrets of search which was a new york times sort of scandal about links and whatnot so that's sort of you can drill into that topic but for most companies the site colon command is a good way to see if you're in uh, if you're really in trouble, if you've really been blacklisted. Okay, um, how do you get your YouTube channel out in the public viewer to show up near the top in Google searches? <laughs> okay, lots of ways. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot. I laugh because there's so many, so many things there. Just sort of back up here, and let's think like a little Googler here. So let's look at a search like how to put on an eyeliner. Okay, so how to put on eyeliner. Notice how the search. The video itself has in the uh, headline, in the description, in the in the title. That's one thing. The title of the video matches the search. But then, when you go to a search, you go to a video like this, you'll often see that the channel has a lot of comments. They have a lot of views. They have a lot of likes and dislikes. So it's a sort of uh, circular. They're trying to create a circular opportunity. So they do their SEO homework, good headline to the video, usually a good description, good tagging. They have to figure out ways to get views. This is where they might email their mailing list. Hey, check out my video. They might promote the video for a while. They've got to get a good likes and dislikes. They like to get a lot of comments. They need to get video comments. So YouTube is a social media animal. It has SEO in it. Does it have keywords? Are people searching for those keywords? It has social media. Are you getting a lot of views? Are you getting a lot of likes? Are you getting a lot of dislikes? Are you getting a lot of comments? By building up that positive buzz energy, that's what gets a video to the top of YouTube search. That's what gets a video to the top of Google search. So you've got to think 
not in one dimension anymore, but in multiple dimensions. And you see that same pattern on, say, Google Places, where you need to get a lot of reviews. The more reviews you get, the better off you get. The more you optimize, the more reviews are from your community, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to create a virtuous circle for a lot of your social media slash SEO venues like YouTube or Google Places. Okay, um, let's see. Um, how important is it to have a Google Places listing if you are a B2B organization that does not do business locally? I think for searches, if searches matter to you, if your customers are coming through Google and you're a WordPress designer, right? WordPress is uh, you know, a good platform for blogging. It's used by lots of B2B. If you want to show up here, if you want people to see your pictures, let's do it one where we'll start to see pictures of Facebook timeline. They're just getting rolled out here. If you want to get your pictures here, if, if it could be searches. People fall into this idea of Google's just B2C. It's not at all. People do industrial fans. This is a B2B search. These pictures are from a merchant center. But the opportunity here is somebody is going to figure out, I can start talking about industrial fans. I can get my picture here. I can maybe even get to be the expert, the industrial fan expert. So to the extent that your customers are searching Google and you're in an area where there's a level of expertise, then I think Google Plus is an opportunity you should certainly start working on. Maybe it'll peter out. Maybe it won't succeed in a year, but maybe it does. So it's a big opportunity because getting you know, your picture to show up on these searches, building your clientele is a huge opportunity for many businesses. So I'm, I think many SEOs, I'm not unusual in that way, are very uh, strong advocates of Google Plus for all companies. Okay, what are the best places to post reviews and how... Oh, I just lost your sound, Noelle. Okay, where, what are the best places to post reviews, and how does one write a Google review? Okay, so <clears throat> let's back up and talk about reviews. So let's go and look. So do a search where you see reviews. So let's um, let me go over here where I'm not signed in. So let's just take the word sushi restaurant. Okay, so you do a search for sushi restaurant. We're staying in Dallas, whatever, and you'll notice, look at this guy, Sushi Zushi has 46 reviews. Click over here. So this restaurant has 46 people who have reviewed it. Okay, What do you have to do? It's not that you review your own restaurant. They try to encourage people who are eating at the restaurant to write reviews. So getting real customers to write real reviews on Google is what you need to do. They have to be a Google person. They have to have a Google account usually a G Gmail account, but it could be just a regular Google account. And at that point, they can click sign in. If I signed in with my Gmail account right now, I could write a review. So the, the strategy as a business owner is to find your listing on Google Places and then slowly but surely encourage your legitimate customers to review you. And that gets a little bit in this gray area because technically, Google, Yelp, whoever, they don't want you to strong arm your customers into reviewing. Now, that's one of my secrets. There's a lot of corruption here. There's a lot of paid reviews going on, a lot of monkey business uh, going on, uh, depending on the industry. So the white hat way to do it is maybe just at the end of the sushi, hey, would you please review us on Google Places? You're going to ask 100 people. Of the 100 people, maybe three review you, but over time you can build your review uh, up. So the Google reviews are more valuable than the other reviews. You'll often see down here at the bottom, you can see this has 34 on Insider Pages. It has how many on Google? It has, it looks like, uh, what was it, this guy here, 23. So you can see that's that favoritism, 23 on Google, 34 on Insider Pages. And of course, you know, this is America. We're on Google system. It rewards their reviews. You can see some of the reviews not so happy, but a review is a review. So the point is your Google Places reviews have more value if Google is where your customers are. Okay, what are the consequences of using companies that you can buy likes from? 
Yes, on all of these, uh, link building, Google reviews, likes on Facebook, there's a whole unfortunate ecosystem of paid reviews, paid like buying, paid link building. The point I'm trying to get across is the paid schemes are rampant. There are lots of paid schemes out there. Are they a violation of terms of service? Yes, they are. If you get discovered, could you be taken off of Google or Yelp or whoever? Absolutely. But it's getting to be a little bit like marijuana use in California, where the laws are being violated every single day of the week. So you can read the law. You'd think that nobody ever gets high in the Bay Area based on the federal law against marijuana. Well, I'm telling you, you know, go to downtown Oakland and, you know, Oaksterdam. So this is kind of the world we live in when it comes to paid reviews. I'm not advocating that you buy reviews, but they're out there and they're rampant. Um, and I just want to make sure that people are aware of that. And just as the police force doesn't exactly announce that the laws are being flagrantly violated, but they are, it's the same kind of disjuncture um, with respect to Google, Yelp, paid reviews, and all this jazz. It's a mess, and I just want to educate people that I work with to know that's the world we live in. Maybe time for one quick question, Noelle. Okay. If you change your image on your website or Google profile, will it change immediately on Google search results? No, I don't believe it will change immediately. It will change with the lag. So what we're talking about is that picture that people see when you do a search. So when you do this search and you see these pictures here, those don't change immediately. I believe there's a lag to that. So I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, we're, our afternoon webinars, we try to make them short. I know it's a big time commitment for people. So thank you for coming. Uh, we'll have another one coming up. We're not even sure what, what it's going to be about yet, but we'll let you know when that's coming up. Uh, we'll have the uh, resources uh, for you. Those will be up uh, late this afternoon, and the email will go out over the weekend with the link. So look for that link, and thank you for showing up. Noel, finish us up with a few words, and thank you, everybody. Okay, well, Jason said we are out of time, but I do want to thank you for attending today's training, today's lunch coffee webinar. Any questions that weren't answered, Jason will um, get to you uh, by email. Generally, we post those on our website under SEO tips, but it does take a while to get them uploaded. We're, we also will be offering um, our first introductory uh, webinar on the top 10 tools for SEO on April the 16th. So there's time for you to, to go ahead and go to our website and get registered for that. It's also a free webinar. Uh, you can find out more information about all of our webinars, our classes, our schedules, books, videos, um, basically a plethora of SEO information by going to our website at jm-seo.org. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everyone else. Have a great day, and we'll see you all real soon. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.